This way, Amwera. The first rays of the early morning sun shimmered through the windows, over which a graceful tree cast its shadow. An immense creeper had draped around the filigreed balcony of Princess Yuruvi's bedroom, making her feel as if she was living in a treehouse as she basked in the freshness of early dawn, the golden sky auspiciously cloudless. A promising way to start my wedding day, she thought, with a sudden burst of happiness. She had slept with the buzz of festivities humming around her and was roused with the droning still in her ears. She woke up to a delightful sight. The palace resembled a floral palanquin. Flaming marigolds and crimson hibiscus with fragrant jasmine flowers, strung together into thick garlands, festooned each cornice and corridor of the palace. The perfume of the threaded flowers merged with the fresh scent of the dew-moistened earth. She heard the soft twitter of birds, the rustle of the gentle breeze in the garden. Finally, she saw the crimson light signaling the birth of a new day, and stepped inside for her bridal bath. Kundi was waiting for her, holding a silver bowl of sandalwood paste. Kundi looked extraordinarily happy. Yuruvi would now be her daughter for keeps and in a short while would make her home in the new palace in Indraprastha. For a moment, a frown darkened her brows as she wondered anxiously how her daughter-in-law Draupadi would welcome her husband Arjuna's new bride. I got the bridal silks especially made for you, she said instead, trying to erase the uneasy thought. It's a deep turmeric yellow, I know you love that color, and you can wrap a red angavastra around, she said as she clasped an exquisite ruby ornament around Yuruvi's slender neck. Yuruvi was almost ill with the guilt swamping her. I can't deceive Kunti, she thought frantically. I have to tell her that, contrary to her expectations, I won't be choosing any of the Pandavas as my husband. Yuruvi looked at Kunti and her heart swelled with emotion. She loved her so much but was about to hurt her so grievously. This was the woman whom she knew to be unbelievably patient, gentle and kind, and so giving. She thought she was a splendid example of a mother who had lived not for herself but for others. Suddenly, Yuruvi asked her, when you look back on your life, do you have any regrets, Ma? Kunti was visibly surprised. What a strange question. Is it a fit of bridal nervousness? She asked, her eyes twinkling. And what's this about regrets? You're not having any qualms about this sway Amwara, are you? She added anxiously. No, no, I am not, Yuruvi replied firmly. I have been looking forward to this day for a long, long time. It's just that I felt like opening up to you. We haven't spoken for ages, and possibly, this will be our very last heart-to-heart -heart talk before I get married, she said under her breath. So, do you ever wish you had done anything differently? repeated Yuruvi, looking into Kunti's serene face. Yes, I wish I hadn't done some things. Hm, quite a few, Kunti's voice trailed off, her tired eyes gazing at the rising sun. She slipped into a moment of wistful contemplation. Both the women settled into a companionable silence, not wanting to interrupt each other's thoughts. But let's keep all that for another day, said Kunti, with her usual gentle smile. Whenever I look at you, I get the feeling you conceal your real self, Yuruvi revealed, sliding a jeweled hand in Kunti's soft, wrinkled one. It's like you are playing a role, living up to an image. You are what the person in front of you wants you to be. What are you really like? How could you accept it when King Sura, your father, gave you away to Kunti Boha, his cousin, because he was childless? I would have been furious, how dare he? Oh, dear, so many questions. The older lady laughed lightly. Yes, I was upset, I felt I was a doll being presented to another person. As Pritha, the daughter of King Sura of the Yadavas, I was given away to King Kunti Boha to be brought up in his home as Kunti. I grew up without a mother but with many maids and nannies. It was fun sometimes. She chuckled wryly. It was as if she was talking about someone else. 
Yurubi looked at her closely and said affectionately, and that's how it has always been, you seem to have everything, yet there was an emptiness in you. Ma, when will you learn to live for yourself? Yurubi tried to voice Kunti's unspoken thoughts. You have played so many roles all your life. As the little Pritha who was given away by her father, you were made to renounce your name to become Kunti Boja's daughter, Kunti. Kunti, the lovely princess, whom many princes wished to marry but who selected King Pandu at her Swayamwara, only to lose him to his second wife Princess Madri. Kunti, a wife who loved her husband so much that she let the childless Madri use the same boon she had been given by sage Durvasa to invoke the divine twins, the Ashwini Kumaras, and give birth to Nikul and Sahadeva. Kunti, who would have preferred to have died with her husband, but lived to be a mother, not just to her sons but to the infant sons of Madri as well. Kunti, the queen who, in an instant, became a king's widow without a kingdom. Kunti, the queen mother, who lived for years in dread, worried about the safety of her five sons. Kunti, the queen mother, yet overshadowed by Draupadi, the daughter-in-law. You are that amazing mother who has always loved me as a daughter. A woman who has an enormous capacity to love and to give, but what have you earned in the bargain? Yurubi stopped as remorse sliced through her. She thought sadly, and like others, I too, will hurt you. Stop dissecting me and tell me what the matter is. Why all these questions, dear? What's troubling you? The moment of truth was at hand. Yurubi knew she owed it to Kunti. She blurted out in wretched helplessness, I cannot marry Arjuna, I am in love with Karna. She hated herself as she watched the color drain from the elderly queen's face. No. Kunti gasped in disbelief, a look of incredulity on her pallid face. No, oh, no. Not Karna. Yurubi knew she had hurt the person whom she loved the most after her parents. She tried desperately to stem the flow of pain her confession had inflicted on Kunti. I grew up with your sons. They are more like my childhood friends. And I do love them. I know you were hoping that I would marry Arjuna but I can't, I can't. Yurubi realized it was futile giving explanations or self-justifications. I am sorry. So very sorry. She cried, hugging Kunti close. The queen mother suddenly looked old and frail. For a long time, Yurubi and Kunti held each other close. Then the older woman disengaged Yurubi's clinging arms and looked straight into her troubled face. Do you realize what you are doing? She asked gently. Forget that I want you as my daughter-in-law. Try to foresee what this marriage may lead to. Karna is already married, with children. His other wife is a Suda, of his caste, but you are not. You will be the outsider in their home. Can you ever live happily with him and his family? You don't even know what life is like away from these palace walls, and you are willing to give up everything to be just another woman in Karna's life, competing for his attention. Will you be able to deal with the problems such a marriage will bring? I must if I have to, Yurubi's eyes flashed with a familiar determined glint. I know I will be happy with him and I will make him happy, she vowed. Kunti stared at her for a long, wistful moment. Is that all? That you want to make him happy? She whispered with a catch in her voice, looking searchingly at her. Yes, cried Yuruvi. And I am not ashamed of falling in love with Karna. Nor am I ashamed of what I am going to do, she added slowly. My feelings for Karna struck me suddenly, leaving me defenseless. He probably doesn't even know I exist, he doesn't know that there is this crazy girl who is madly in love with him. My world turned upside down the moment I saw him at Hastinapur that evening at the arena. She heard Kunti draw in her breath sharply. You remember that day, Ma. Yurubi turned excitedly to the older lady, her face elated. It was the most unforgettable day of my life. I don't know why I care so much for him, Dot, but I do, very much. 
Yurubi continued, her face flushed as she thought of the man who had unknowingly captured her thoughts, her life. I love him. I want him. I'll do anything to have him and I'll make him care for me. I'd even die for him, there, ma, now you know. Kunti gave her a long, lingering look. You are so tempestuous, child, she said finally. Who would believe that you just uttered those words? There's not an ounce of sentimentality in you, you have always been so down to earth, dot and there you go and fall in love. Now you are at once practical and passionate, not willing to let go of the chance you have to get what you want. I know you are capable of giving love. Most people can't, she heaved a long sigh. If that is how you feel, both of you have all my love and my blessings. Never fear, child, I am with you, Kundi tenderly kissed the bride's forehead, her tears falling fast and thick. May God give you the strength to lead the life you have chosen, dot the strength I lacked, she muttered under her breath. Yurubi couldn't quite catch her words and frowned. Wipe that frown off dear, you have a new life awaiting you. Kunti smiled. Yurubi was relieved that Kunti did not look miserable anymore. In fact, Kunti's smile was one of happiness. The city of Pukia turned festive as the people prepared to witness the opulence of a royal wedding. The glorious carousing rang out for fourteen celebratory days, the sound of drumbeats loud and clear. Colorful fairs, full of entertaining games and shows, had been arranged and there were gifts for everyone. The princes and suitors were as nervous as the giggling maids-in-waiting, walking briskly through the marbled hallways of the new guest houses handsomely designed to accommodate the Swayamwara guests. The marriage hall was as imposing as the enchanting gardens encircling it. Its walls were covered with wild rose creepers, covering every inch in scented luxuriance. Against the rising palms and the vivid flame of the forest trees, the lotus-shaped marriage hall bloomed, beautifully decorated with marigolds, roses, hibiscus and Princess Yuruvi's favorite wreaths of fragrant jasmines. This is going to be the best day of my life, King Vahusha promised himself as he donned his royal robes, knowing it was probably his saddest day as well. Princess Yuruvi's Swayamwara was well attended with many brave kings, princes and noblemen of the country seated under the golden dome of the marriage hall. The hundred sons of Dhritarashtra were in attendance, as well as the five Pandava princes. Krishna was there with his elder brother Balarama, as were Drishtadiyamna, King Drupad's son, Karna with his friend Ashwadhamma, the son of Guru Dranakarya, Sisupala, the king of Chedi, and Jarasandha, the king of Magadha. The venerated triumvirate of the Hastinapur royal court, Bhishma Pitamaha, Guru Dranakarya and his brother-in-law, Guru Kripacharya, the chief priest, were present to bestow blessings on the couple, their dear princess who would surely choose everyone's favorite, Prince Arjuna. Besides the suitors and royalty, the hall was packed with eager spectators from all over the kingdom. And above the din of voices, the festive drums beat rhythmically in accompaniment to the notes of a hundred musical instruments. Karna wondered what he was doing in this resplendent hall, crowded with the bravest and noblest of kings. He wanted to be far away from this madness. This Swayamwara was a travesty, he thought wryly, the outcome of which was known to all, Princess Yuruvi of Pukia would choose Prince Arjuna as everyone had guessed, and they would live happily ever after. Karna heaved a long sigh, trying to shut out a memory that was wrenching his soul, Draupadi's Swayamwara. The marriage hall at Panchala had been as lavishly decorated as this one, he recalled, staring at the swaying garlands of marigolds. And when, eventually, the princess of Panchala had arrived in splendor, she had looked ravishing. Princess Draupadi had voiced a single condition for her Swayamwara, she would only wed the best archer, the prince who could shoot his arrow on target to pierce the eye of a rotating wooden fish. He could aim only by looking at its reflection in a bowl of water, not directly at it. Each suitor would have one single chance to do this. Evidently, only the best archer could succeed, and Karna had felt a smug confidence at the time. 
This meant it would be either him or Arjuna. To win the hand of the beautiful princess would mean winning great prestige as well, Karna thought with a smile, as he had slowly walked up to the center of the hall. He held the bow, lifted it easily and was about to string it when a sharp voice commanded him to stop. He turned. It was Princess Draupadi speaking to him, loudly and haughtily. Wait. She ordered. You may be a king now, O king of Anga, but you are not of royal birth. I am a king's daughter and will not wed a base-born man. As Draupadi, the Yajnaseni, the one born out of fire, I insist on being declared a Viryashulka, a bride to be won by the worthiest and the very best. I will not allow a low-born Sudaputra to participate in the challenge. Please do not proceed. The entire assembly was shocked into silence. Stunned at her cruel words, Karna had flung the bow down and turned away with the words, O oh son! Be my witness that I cast aside the bow, not because I am unable to hit the mark, but because the princess mocks me. Karna could still feel the agony of that moment. The humiliation still seared his pride, setting him aflame with anger. The memory remained a raw legion that festered. It was not the first time that Karna had been taunted about his birth, yet Draupadi's words wounded him as nothing else had ever done. It stung him even now. Suddenly, the ringing tone of trumpets sounded and Karna was thrust into the present once more. A grand procession of the princely guests from Sernjaya, Cambodia, Kuru, Kasala and many other kingdoms, with their different flags and gorgeously decorated elephants, chariots and horses, their soldiers in glittering uniforms, passed by slowly, with King Vahusha in the forefront. It was time for the princess to arrive for the ceremony and all her suitors took their seats, waiting eagerly. When at last, the princess dismounted from her elephant, conch shells, bugles, MRD angas and kettledrums blared. The ankle bells of dancing girls tinkled merrily to the music of Venus, flutes, gongs and cymbals, all rising to a crescendo. Princess Yuruvi entered the hall and for one electric moment, there was an odd hush. King Vahusha knew that no one could keep their eyes off her exquisite beauty, now enhanced by the bridal finery she wore. Confident and self-assured, Arjuna gazed at the princess he thought was his future bride, while Krishna looked pensive and Duryodhana leered. The observant Ashwatthama noticed that his friend Karna was mesmerized by the princess standing quietly, with her head elegantly bowed, he didn't seem as uninterested as he had pretended to be a few moments back, he thought. God forbid that this Swayamwara erupts in violence like Draupadi's Swayamwara, he shuddered involuntarily. If Karna was spurned by this haughty princess as well, Ashwatthama knew his friend wouldn't be able to take such an insult. Fearing a repeat of the previous fiasco, Ashwatthama's hand instinctively clenched his sword as he fervently wished he could whisk Karna away. The bride looked ethereal, her face radiant like her flowing silks. Her dark eyes sparkled as brilliantly as the glittering jewels adorning her. With a magnificent garland in her bejeweled hands, her eyes downcast, she did not look up at the valiant princes in front of her. The priests solemnly chanted mantras invoking peace and blessings as King Vahusha led his most prized possession by the hand to the center of the suddenly quiet hall. Hear all, O princes seated in this assembly, he pronounced in a loud, clear voice. This is but an ordinary swayamwara of an extraordinary princess. There are no tests of valor, of bravery or skills. It is but the honest desire of the princess to garland a young man present here whom she wishes to marry. That man has won my daughter's heart and shall win her hand in marriage. Her decision will be undisputed and fulfilled with my blessings. He turned to Yuruvi and said firmly, Proceed, my child. May God bless you. Standing with her hands clasping the garland, Yuruvi felt acutely vulnerable as she felt hundreds of eyes boring into her, observing her slightest movement. The princes were seated in a semicircle. 
On her right sat the Pandavas with Krishna, to her extreme left was Karna, seated between Duryodhana and Ashwatthama. She wondered how she could approach the man she wanted to garland. She could either head straight for Karna or walk the entire semicircle to garland him. Either way, she would be humiliating the Pandavas. She faltered as she took her first steps, feeling a moment's panic, her heart thudding hard. And in that moment it flashed upon her that she would indeed have to be brave to get Karna. For to have him, she would deeply wound many whose affection she cherished, her parents, Krishna, Bhishma Pitamaha and above all, Kunti, to whom she had divulged her heart's secret. She was burdened with guilt and pain instead of the joy she had anticipated feeling. She hung her head, a stab of self-deprecation knifing through her. Could she ever be happy by making those whom she loved most, so unhappy? She despaired, wondering why she had to lose so much to gain what she desired the most. Now, she wanted to end this misery quickly. She found herself moving in Karna's direction and felt his eyes piercing hard at her as though into her very soul. Her feet seemed to have a will of their own, gliding towards the golden armored warrior. She lifted her head to look at him and her eyes remained riveted on him as she approached him, her steps slow but sure. As she walked towards him, he seemed to draw tantalizingly close and she could see the gold flecks in his tawny eyes. He had beautiful sunset, or were they sunrise, eyes. They were a molten gold, blazing with inner fire. Dark and brooding, they were shaded with long, thick lashes under well-marked eyebrows, while below them was an aquiline nose and a full mouth. She had not noticed all this before, oh, he was beautiful. There was a refinement and a strange spiritual quality in his face that was almost poignant. Surprise dawned in his eyes the moment she paused in front of him, proud and bold, but a quivering mass of nerves within. He sat still in his chair, looking at her with rising perplexity. The thick rose garland in her hand suddenly seemed incredibly heavy and her arms ached. She steeled herself, looked straight into his amazed eyes and leaned forward. She heard the sharp intake of his breath and saw him instinctively lower his beautiful head so that she could place the garland around his neck. Then, at last, he was hers. A stunned hush enveloped the gathering, the silence was almost palpable. And the uproar that swiftly followed was riotous. Boiling rage and insults erupted from every corner. This is a public insult, shouted Bhima, his disbelief curdling into a bitter wrath. The assembly broke into pandemonium. A swayamwara means choosing a bridegroom from the same social class, a kshatriya bride cannot marry beneath her. The prince is raged. She has to choose one amongst us, a kshatriya, Arjuna interjected pointedly. If she does not care to marry a prince, she should either remain a virgin or jump into a pyre. It is vital that the social status of a woman is not lowered. The princess cannot marry a man of a lower caste, barked another incensed king. Pradaloma is prohibited by the Shastras. King Vihusha, how could you allow this outrage? How dare your daughter choose a Sudaputra? We cannot sanction this marriage, it's blasphemy. And it's a sacrilege of the practice of Swayamwara as well. We shall fight to protect it. A violent battle seemed about to erupt. In a quick movement, Karna pulled his sword out of its scabbard and held it up, the naked blade glinting in the noon sun. He was ready to take on the warring princes single-handedly. Duryodhana and Ashwatthama promptly unsheathed their swords too and stood by the side of their friend. Duryodhana shouted menacingly, not a drop of blood will go wasted. Arjuna and Bhima brandished their swords too, but were restrained by the warning hand of their mother, who shook her head in silent censure. It is her choice. Respect it, she chided them softly. Arjuna detected the reprimand in his mother's voice and wondered what he had done wrong. 
He knew that his mother was aware he had loved Yuruvi with open devotion since she was a bratty little girl with wild, cascading hair and laughing eyes. As the besotted young boy, he was elated when his mother assured him that this teasing child would be his wife one day. Yuruvi was meant to be his bride and he would fight for her as honor demanded. He felt a cold fury crystallize inside him and he swept a look of contemptuous dislike at Karna. Is that her choice? A lowly upstart, a pariah, an unwelcome outsider. His voice was glacial. As Kunti rightly says, it is Yuruvi who has selected her life partner and it's her choice, Krishna's calm voice interrupted him. What she decides to do is going to determine her life. She has the freedom to choose whom she wants to marry. She chooses Karna, just as Draupadi selected you over Karna, murmured Krishna. Arjuna fumed. Was Krishna gently reminding him of Draupadi's Swayamwara where the situation had been reversed? Then, it was he who had won Draupadi and Karna had been rebuffed. This time, it was he who had been set aside and Karna had won the fair bride. For an instant, Arjuna, drowning in the waves of humiliation and dishonor, recognized what Karna must have suffered when Draupadi had turned him down. Yuruvi might not have been as maliciously explicit as Draupadi, but her unspoken rejection of Arjuna was just as devastating. Arjuna had never experienced rejection and wondered if he could live through this moment of utter shame. Mortification washed over him and icy rage froze in his veins. Yuruvi could have spared him this public indignity, Arjuna swore, as he watched her stand close to Karna. He felt another familiar emotion welling inside him. Arjuna recognized it as hatred, that single emotion he felt for this contemptible man, undiluted hate for this rival who was standing belligerently amidst the screaming crowd of angry princes. In the haze of hate, Arjuna did not see a noble warrior before him. He saw instead the charioteer's son who had, long ago, turned up uninvited and disrupted the contest at Hastinapur, performing better than him in each of his feats. This stranger was inflicting the same indignity on him now as well, snatching away what was rightfully his. Arjuna saw in him an insolent villain who had insinuated himself in the life of his cousin Duryodhana's, who, in turn, flaunted Karna's abilities in the royal court, annoying people like Guru Dranakarya and Bhishma Pitamaha, the two gurus revered by Arjuna. He saw him as an upstart suitor who had dared to think of marrying Draupadi. And now again, this usurper had dared to steal Yuruvi, who was supposed to be his bride-to-be. Arjuna saw Karna as his sole enemy, an intruder who had marched brazenly into his life to mock him and divest him of his pride. Arjuna recalled the moment he had first heard Karna's name, mentioned by Ashwadhamma at Guru Dronacharya's ashram. Ashwadhamma had described Karna as the best archer ever born. Even at that time, Arjuna had resented this unexpected praise. A few months later, that same wretched archer had publicly trounced him at the Hastinapur archery contest where Arjuna had been the favorite all along. This pariah had stolen his moment of glory. Then Arjuna's fury had swiftly turned into contempt when he learned that Karna was but a lowly charioteer's son. Jealousy had poisoned Arjuna. He burned with rage each time he caught sight of the Sudaputra entering the royal court as the king of Anga, and resentment consumed him every time he was hailed as a master archer. He recoiled when people praised the friendship between his cousin and this commoner. Friend and cousin, both were despicable in his eyes, an enemy's friend was an enemy as well. But if he disliked his cousin, Arjuna loathed Karna violently, openly contemptuous of this low-born, self-proclaimed warrior. And right now, in the middle of the Swayamwara Hall, Arjuna felt the acrid taste of hate as he stood defeated this time too. He had lost, once again, to this man. Feeling his eyes on her, Yuruvi glanced at Arjuna, her childhood friend and the suitor she had publicly spurned. She sensed rather than saw the raw loathing in his eyes. 
She felt as if she'd been poisoned. She wrenched her eyes away from his venomous glare and turned to the scene unfolding before her. Yuruvi appeared composed, but inside she was screaming at the world to let her be with her beloved. To just let them be. Although Karna's arm around her shoulders assured her of his protection, she was only too aware that her father and Kundi were right to warn her of the consequences of her action. Could she brave the terrible hostilities she had triggered? She saw her father, Bhishma Pitamaha, Krishna and Balarama trying to mollify the infuriated princes. The Pandavas stood still, searing her with their collective anger. Kunti stood silently with them, her eyes appealing for peace. My daughter's decision is her own and I, as her father, stand by it completely, King Vahusha declared loudly, his hands folded, his head bowed. She has selected Karna, the king of Anga, and he has won her hand in marriage. I appeal to everyone to respect the choice made at the Swayamwara. But Duryodhana was not one to remain discreetly quiet. If a woman can get married to five husbands, can't a princess select a man of her choice as her husband? He sneered, looking pointedly at the Pandavas. Others soon joined in the heckling. Arjuna drew out his sword, its sharp edge glinting in the sun. At this ominous moment, Krishna got up and asked the guests to hear him out. He said, King Bahusha invited all those he thought were deserving of the honor of winning his daughter's hand. And no one doubts Karna's valor and uprightness. This is a Swayamwara and the bride-to-be has the final say. She has the right to reject any of the suitors for any reason, she has the right to choose whomever she wants. I am requesting all of you to let the wedding proceed. Though Krishna, the king of Dwarka, believed by many to be the avatar of Vishnu the preserver, the supreme god, was not too well liked by some, he was unanimously feared. There have been instances of Pratiloma marriages in the past, which had been resorted to in exceptional cases, arbitrated Krishna, in a conciliatory tone. Emperor Yayati, one of the ancestors of the Pandavas and the Kauravas, married Deviani, the daughter of sage Sukracharya, and this is only one example of a Brahmin girl marrying a Kshatriya prince. The Shastras declare what is right and what is forbidden. They also say that once a marriage has been agreed upon in public, it cannot be annulled. Yuruvi, by garlanding Karna, has chosen him as her husband, and I declare them married. His words worked their magic. Grudgingly, the suitors gave their consent for the marriage proceedings to continue. Yuruvi flashed Krishna a grateful glance. He nodded his head elegantly. You were always a willful child, Krishna whispered as she bent down to touch his feet, bestowing her with his knowing smile and his blessings. The marriage was celebrated with renewed aplomb and the city of Pukia rejoiced with great fervor. It was decided that Princess Yuruvi would accompany her husband, Karna, to his home early next morning, so the festivities continued late into the night, almost until the sun slowly lit up the sky to herald the beginning of her new life.